I wonder if you're enjoying the hot weather. <laughs> kind of, sort of. The longer it goes on, the less, I find, as someone who um, enjoys his sleep at night. How do you find sleeping when it's hot? It's not easy, is it? I'm going to try and keep you awake during a, a sermon in a hot room now. <laughs> and um, when it's just nicely warm, it does send us to sleep. But when it's hot, it's not great, is it? Well, this evening, we're going to do a kind of a little short, very short and incomplete, uh, but still nevertheless, theology of sleep. Uh, not the sleep we get at night, although it has similar similarities, uh, but the sleep that the Bible speaks about for Christians, for believers in the Lord Jesus, for those that the Lord Jesus loves and has made his. I, I do love my sleep, Lou will tell you that, and I'm one of those blessed people who when my head hits the, the pillow, I just go to sleep. It infuriates Lou, because <laughs> she doesn't. Um, but sleep's great, isn't it? It's a gift from God. And you might remember the Old Testament story of Elijah, who when he's feeling battered and bruised and under attack, and he runs and he complains to God that all's going wrong, he's the only one left, and so on and so forth. All these things coming on Elijah. One of the things God does is he gives him the gift of sleep. He gets a good night's sleep given by God, and it restores the body, it restores the soul. To be honest, I, I enjoy the heat during the day quite a bit, actually. I, I quite like it. But with every day, you get that bit grumpier, don't you? <laughs> during the day. And I don't think it's so much the heat during the day, it's the lack of sleep at night. We need sleep. Uh, God made us as people to sleep so that we're restored and refreshed for the next day. Well, there's a line this morning um, in John chapter 11. We looked at John 11 and Jesus uh, raising Lazarus from the dead. It's a line that is spoken by one of the disciples, um, Thomas, in chapter 11 and verse 12. So, I'll just read a few verses either side uh, again. So, verse 11, uh, Jesus says, just given a little bit of teaching and then he told the disciples our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep but I'm on my way to wake him up now Thomas quite rightly thinks this is uh, oh sorry it's all the disciples at this point it's not just Thomas is it it's Thomas says something later it's all the disciples at this point uh, are, are pleased to hear this that's good news he's just asleep and they say to Jesus Lord if he has fallen asleep, he will get well. He will get well. One of the things when we're poorly, we sleep longer, don't we? That's a good thing. Uh, often it's a good thing. Because while we sleep, our body gets the chance to repair itself, to, to fight whatever bug we may have. And we recover. So they, they take it very literally in that way. Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will get well. Uh, but, I think I said this morning, without really opening up, he spoke truer and deeper words than he knew when he said that. Or when they said that. All, I presume it's all twelve. They spoke better and deeper than they knew. Uh, the Bible is full, actually, of people who unknowingly speak words that have a deeper meaning than they realise. Uh, Caiaphas, the the, one of the chief priests, isn't he, in the Gospels, uh, talks about it, it's better to, for one man to be given on behalf of all the people than, and basically he's thinking, than the Romans attack a lot of us. But he, he spoke better than he knew. Jesus would die for the sins of all his people. That's not what Caiaphas meant. But it was true, and it's often quoted in that way, and quite rightly, here the disciples do. If he's fallen asleep, he'll get well. And the New Testament's teaching, actually, is that Christians don't die. They fall asleep. Now, I've stated that in an absolute way. But yes, we do physically die. We do. But the Bible very frequently speaks of that for the Christian as falling asleep. Falling asleep. Uh, Jesus would use this language 
on more than one occasion in the Gospels. He uses it here uh, as he speaks of Nazareth, uh, Nazareth, Lazarus. Uh, but you may recall he uses it as well when he speaks of another person who he was going to raise from the dead. So if you, we're going to flip around a bit this evening. Uh, if you were to turn to Matthew, for example, Matthew's Gospel and chapter 9. Um, Matthew 9 uh, mentions the two miracles that, that happen close together. You have one of the uh, synagogue leaders, a man called Jairus. I don't think he's named actually in Matthew's Gospel, but we know from the other Gospels. Um, he comes to Jesus because his daughter has just died. Uh, Matthew 9, verse 18. He believes that actually Jesus can raise her. So Jesus goes to the house on the way though. He's sidetracked short, for a short time by a woman who had suffered bleeding for 12 years. She touches his robe. She's made well. But then, verse 23, he comes to the leader, and that's Jairus' house. When Jesus came to the house, verse 23, he saw the flute players and a crowd lamenting loudly, a sign in that culture that someone has died. Leave, he said, because the girl is not dead, but asleep. And they laughed at him. After the crowd had been put upside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl got up. The news of this spread throughout that whole area. Uh, from that, we're not supposed to understand that she had literally just fallen asleep and somebody had misdiagnosed her as dead. She was dead. But this was someone Jesus loved. He performed that miracle of giving her life again, but he describes it as being woken up from sleep. People that Jesus loves, his people, don't die so much as sleep. They fall asleep so that's two times in the gospels uh, where people that Jesus sets his love upon he says they're sleeping Jairus' daughter and Lazarus it's to teach us that death has no permanent hold on God's people physical death does not permanently have a hold on those who know and follow Jesus uh, again in Matthew's gospel you to turn right to the end of Matthew uh, and Matthew 27 and verse 52 uh, we'll, we'll read from verse 50 actually so this is the account of uh, the death of Jesus his own uh, dying on the cross in our place bearing our sins uh, but there's that bizarre incident halfway through in you know, as a young Christian, I'd read it, I'd have no idea what's going on there and why that's happening. So, verse 50, But Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and gave up his spirit. Suddenly, the curtain of the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom. Uh, there's that picture there of the, the place in the temple where God dwelt under the old covenant. Uh, the, the temple curtains torn in two. We can enter the presence of God. Jesus has opened up the way into God's presence through paying for our sin so that we can come to God. But also, end of verse 51, the earth quaked and rocks were split. The tombs were opened also and many bodies of the saints, it's interesting how they're described, isn't it? Who had fallen asleep were raised. Now, Again, falling asleep, we're not supposed to take it that they were having a nap. They've been dead for years, centuries perhaps even. And they came out of the tombs after his resurrection, entered the holy city and appeared to many. They'd fallen asleep. Because of Jesus' death and resurrection, they wake up. Uh, now, that was a kind of a one-off but it was a little picture of what Jesus' death and resurrection achieves for his people. Because of his death, his people's physical death is simply sleep. Something from which 
they will wake up. We could go on. So, if you were to flip again forward now into the book of Acts. Uh, The book of Acts. Without looking, what happened to Stephen after he gave his speech in chapter 7? I would just say he died. (laughs) And to be honest, my translation of the Bible says he died as well. But then it's got a little, um, one of those little notes that you can read at the bottom. Uh, So you you get to the the end of his uh, speech. Um, Let me just read the very end of his speech from verse 51 and then we'll keep going to the end of the chapter. Stephen gives his speech uh, to the Jews, Jewish leaders, many of them, who were opposing the gospel, opposing Jesus as being the Messiah who had died and risen again. Uh, Opposing the fact that people were beginning to teach Christians that the way to God is, is not through the temple, the physical temple, but the temple that is Jesus. We meet God in Jesus. Verse 51, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised hearts and ears, you're always resisting the Holy Spirit. As your ancestors did, you do also. Which of the prophets did your ancestors not persecute? They even killed those who foretold the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You received the law under the direction of angels and yet have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were enraged and gnashed their teeth at him. Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven. He saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. He said, look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man, that's Jesus, standing at the right hand of God. There he yelled at the top of their voices, covered their ears and together rushed against him. They dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Isn't that like Jesus when he died? Lord, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And after saying this, he... Now, my Bible says died, but then it's got a little letter D beside it, and I look at the bottom, and yours might do something like this as well, and it says 7, verse 60, literally, he fell asleep. He fell asleep. Uh, Jesus' people don't die, they fall asleep. They fall asleep. I think this helps to explain another verse that we kind of looked at a bit this morning in John chapter 11, but we weren't able to stop and and dwell in detail on everything. Uh, John chapter 11, verses uh, 25 and 26. It's the heart of the passage, really, in John 11, and all that happens with Jesus and and Lazarus and those he speaks to. Because he does that, remember, for the sake of his disciples, for, for those watching, so that they'll believe in him and have life in him. That's why he delayed going to Lazarus, so that Lazarus would be dead when he got there. He says to Martha, who has realised that when Jesus returns, there will be a resurrection of everyone. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. So there's an example there of the fact that we, we can use the language of dying for Christians, it's true. Our bodies die. But then the way he phrases the next thing needs another explanation. Verse 26. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. That almost sounds like a contradiction of verse 25, doesn't it? Even if he dies, he will live. Oh, so they do die. Verse 26. But whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? I think we explain what he says there by the fact that the Bible speaks of Christians not as dying in the way that those who don't know Jesus die but as falling asleep there's a sense in which even physically the Christian doesn't die 
We're used to talking about that spiritually. We believe in Jesus and we receive eternal spiritual life. But there's a sense in which we do die, physically we do, but do we stay physically dead? Or do we fall asleep? Jesus thinks of it as falling asleep. Our bodies fall asleep. I don't know if I've convinced you as we've looked at these passages. But the Apostle Paul picks up on this language that Jesus uses. Picks up on the the language that Luke uses when he writes about um, Stephen being stoned to sleep. He picks up on it in two passages in particular uh, in the New Testament. Uh, One of them is the one we read earlier. Uh, You might want to turn to it again. So turn to 1 Thessalonians and chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians and chapter 4. We read from verse uh, 13 to 18. I'm going to read them again um, slowly and just with a few comments as we go. See how Paul speaks of the Christian's death and why he speaks of it that way. Verse 13. He's writing to Christians in Thessalonica who are physically alive. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, concerning those who are dead. No. Nope. Concerning those who are asleep. But we know that Paul here is speaking of what we normally call death, physical death. <laughs> He said, we don't want to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, concerning those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve like the rest, who have no hope. (coughs) Sleep isn't the end, is it? Um, When you go to sleep at night... You go with every expectation that you will wake in the morning, refreshed. Now there may come a time when God takes someone in their sleep, and we know folk that that have happened too. But the majority of the time, sleep, we wake from. That's the normal pattern of life, isn't it? We wake. And Paul wants the Thessalonian Christians to know that those people that they love, who are also Christians, they've fallen asleep. I don't think he means that they've spiritually fallen asleep. Think of Jesus on the cross speaking to the the criminal next to him. Today you'll be with me in paradise. Spiritually, that man would be with Jesus in paradise. But what happened to his body as he died on the cross next to Jesus? Well, the Bible would teach it fell asleep, that body. We shouldn't really talk of it as an it. It's still them. He fell asleep. That's what Paul's talking about here. Those who have fallen asleep, they physically died. Verse 14, for we believe that Jesus died and rose again. In the same way, through Jesus, God will bring those who have fallen, with, God will bring with him, with Jesus, those who have fallen asleep. This is all connected to Jesus' death and resurrection, isn't it? Uh, Jesus' death and resurrection gives us spiritual hope, spiritual life. But it also gives us hope for what happens to our bodies. At the end point of our salvation, if you like, spoken about at the end of the book of Revelation, is not that we're disembodied spiritual beings floating around in heaven. The end point is that we're resurrected physical people with our spirit who are like Jesus who has risen because we have died and risen with him. There's a delay between when our resurrection happens and his happens. His happened within three days of his death. Ours hasn't happened yet and Unless Jesus returns very soon, probably won't happen within three days of us falling asleep. But it will happen. Notice how 
how Paul continues to write in verse 15. For we say this to you by a word from the Lord. We who are still alive at the Lord's coming. Now I think there's a suggestion there that Paul was expecting Jesus to come very soon. He even thought that Jesus may well come within his own or the lifetime of the people he was writing to. But Jesus hasn't returned yet, but it doesn't mean he won't. He will. None of us know when he will return, and ultimately Paul didn't either. But some Christians will be alive when he returns. Physically still alive, they won't have died yet. He says then, and he's writing to Christians through all the ages in the end, we who are still alive at the Lord's coming will certainly not precede those who have, and again he says, fallen asleep. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the archangel's voice and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ, so he can use that language too, but again it's often that he is asleep, the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are still alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Isn't that encouraging? Isn't that a wonderful picture? As I look forward to, to Resurrection Day, I'm, I'm presuming that I'll be one of those who wakes up. Jesus may return, return sooner, but if he doesn't return in the next 50 years or so, I'm going to be one of those who's fallen asleep. And I guess most of us will be too. Um, we'll rise first, we'll go up to be with Jesus. And then those who are left behind will meet us in the air. Those who are still on the earth, God's people meet us. Isn't that a wonderful picture? Doesn't that change our perspective on death as Christians? Uh, as Paul says there in this chapter, passage, it doesn't mean that we don't grieve when people are taken from us. We do. We do. Uh, Lazarus and Jesus, Jesus wept as he saw the effect of the grief on Mary and Martha because they'd lost their brother who they loved. It's still a, an awful intruder in this world. But we face it with hope, certain hope. It's as easy for Jesus to bring back our dead bodies to life as it is for us to wake someone up, which I know isn't always easy, but we can do it. He wakes the dead. And we're with him. So it's a source of great hope for us. Great encouragement. That's how Paul wants us to use these words. There in verse 18. Therefore encourage one another with these words. We don't have to look at death in the way the world does. This morning we talked about how death is taboo in the world. Most people just don't want to talk about it. Because it's so final. It, it's so hopeless. But for us as Christians, it's not. It's still an enemy. As we'll see in a moment. But we face it with hope and a certainty that one day we'll get our bodies back. And now if you're thinking I'd rather get rid of it, and I'm getting to the age where I am, um, it'll be, well let's see what it'll be. Turn to the other passage where Paul uh, talks about death as sleep, if you like, for the Christian. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, we're going to have a look at um, the end of this chapter. Well, actually, let's have a look at the start, first of all. Um, let's have a look at verse 12 through to verse uh, 22. I'll just read it through. Again, you'll, you'll pick up the language that Paul uses. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation is in vain, and so is your faith. Moreover, we are found to be false witnesses about God, because we have testified wrongly about God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless, you are still in your sins. Those then who have fallen asleep in Christ have also perished. In other words, if Christ isn't raised, 
then what we're calling sleep in Christ is actually death. It's perishing. If we have put our hope in Christ for this life only, this physical life until we physically die, we should be pitied more than anyone. But as it is, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, that was Adam, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For just as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. Again, our waking up is linked to Christ's resurrection. In fact, without it, we don't wake up. It really is an everlasting sleep. It's death. It's perishing. But move on as well. One last thing to look at and then we'll, we'll close. To, to near the end of the chapter. To verses uh, 50 to 53. It's the end of this really fa- fantastic, wonderful chapter on the resurrection. Paul sums up his argument from verse 50. What I am saying, brothers and sisters, is this. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor can corruption inherit incorruption. Listen, I'm telling you a mystery. We will not all fall asleep. What he means by that is some will still be alive when Christ returns physically. We won't all fall asleep, but we will all be changed. What does he mean? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we will be changed. This corruptible body, body notice, not just spirit, must be clothed with incorruptibility. And this mortal body, this physical body that will die one day, will fall asleep, must be clothed with immortality. Do you know it's the must? Salvation isn't complete until we have a physical body that has been woken up and has been made perfect. God's work of salvation in Jesus isn't finished when we physically die. It isn't yet finished for those who are in glory now. With him, in spirit. They're with him, but it's not done, is it? Otherwise Paul wouldn't write what he writes here. Our bodies have to be made incorruptible. They have to be clothed with immortality. That's some sleep that ends up with that, isn't it? Every morning I long to wake up feeling refreshed and ready and bouncing out of bed for the new day. It never quite happens anymore. I do feel a little bit more energetic than I felt at 11 o'clock the night before. After I've had um, a cup of tea and a bit of breakfast and got going. But when we wake up on the day that Christ returns with that trumpet sound, your body will be unimaginable compared to what it is now. It will be incorruptible, all the effects of sin removed. It will be immortal. It will never die. It will never ache. It will never hurt. It will never cry. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that wonderful? When this corruptible body is clothed with incorruptibility, verse 54, and this mortal body is clothed with immortality, then the saying that is written will take place. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where death is your victory? Where death is your sting? The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, it all comes through him. Are you looking forward to the resurrection? Isn't it a fantastic thing to look forward to? 
And because we've got that to look forward to, here's what Paul says we should do now. Knowing that we've got that to look forward to, and it's certain, we will wake up like that. Verse 58, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, be steadfast. Don't, don't be thrown off the Christian life. Stick to Jesus. Hold on to him as he holds on to you. Be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the Lord's work. Be about it now in this life. Because you know that your labour for the Lord is not in vain. Now if Christ was not raised and we're not going to be raised, all that we're doing now is in vain, isn't it? It's pointless. What's the point of living for God now if it all ends when I die? But Paul says, no, that's, that's not going to be it. That will have a significance for eternity. As you live on into eternity, it's not in vain. It's all looking forward and working towards what's to come. Because you're in Christ, who has died and risen. So that when you die, it's like falling asleep. He'll wake you to that incorruptible, immortal life with him. Should we pray? Father, we thank you that the disciples did speak better than they knew when they said, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, that means he'll get well again. Father, we thank you. That's true for each of us. One day, unless, Lord, you return sooner, we'll fall asleep. We'll die. But we thank you for the Christian that that means that one day we'll wake up better, weller than we've ever been. With resurrection bodies like Jesus' resurrection body. With all trace of sin removed and all its effects. So that we live for him and are like him. And take joy in giving him the glory. So Lord, we pray that that hope, certain hope we have for the future, would help us in the present. It would give us joy in living for you now. And we ask it in your name. Amen.